Hello, and welcome to Kaiserreich, the Russian Republic, 1936. It is by President Alexander Kerensky that barely survived the Civil War. Only the German intervention did his government overthrow the Reds, and the Whites succeeded. But now, instability was still rampant, though not nearly as bad before. Kerensky was the only thing keeping the Republic alive, along with the 1918 Constitution, along with Russia, one and indivisible. In 1936, Kerensky had high hopes. The German economy was roaring, and the Constitution guaranteed freedom and stability. With this position, he opted to increase industry in the North to please the Soviets, and the remnants of the Soviets at least and to increase the overall industrial capacity of the nation. All was well, perhaps. Maxim Tokarov rifle machine gun was developed. Machine tools and construction were put into practice and research. And in the military sphere, military equipment was put into production all across to fill the empty stocks of Russian. But now, all was too well. Alexander Kerensky was shot and killed by an assassin, and he was climbing the steps to the Russian house. And thus, a shot was run across the world, and Russia was plunged into chaos once more. After the death, the Mensheniks secured the majority in the Duma and declared the Republic, or at least a continuation of the Republic. The commander, Baron Wrangel, and my storm Petrograd and dissolved the Duma. However, this did not last long as Kornilov came with a bigger army and ordered Wrangel down. He seized the apparatus of the state and claimed the paternal autocracy of the Russian Republic. It remained what would happen. It remained to be seen, rather, what would happen with Kornilov and Zhanspot. It was reminding everyone of the Tsardom. Reminding people like the Alish who declared their own independence to escape this new and treacherous time. Boris Sturmer, experienced politician, also died. Popularity stumbled to low, as Kerensky kept the Union together, but now Kornilov only promised to bring the Tsar back, or at least that's what it seemed like to the Soviets and to other more left-leaning people. Other parts of the world, Edward VIII was crowned as King of Britain, and vowed to take back the former lands. And now at home, Kornilov, after sacking his temporary Prime Minister, who was unpopular with the Republican factions, installed instead Boris Savnikov, the leader of the National Republic Party of Russia, the People's Republican Party of Russia, excuse me, into the government and often the post of Prime Minister. Although they weren't exactly similar, and not on the best of terms, Kornilov hoped that the Savonov would be able to reconstruct the glory of the Russian state with him. And Kornilov shall save Holy Russia, or so it was said. The alliance was firmly decided when he formally invited the Vos of the peasants into the government, him and his ministers. He denied Marshal Dinkins' offer to secure the state and lock out all the factions and Mokoski was firmly never even considered. The Vorst had arrived. It remained to be seen what would happen though, with the paternal autocrats not being popular, and the People's Republicans not popular as well. However, all came to naught when the brest levosk preparations were demanded immediately from Germany. With no way to resist, Russia had to accept. And this pushed Russia into a weak economic depression, at least a small one, that would last a year. With Russia uncovering from this political and economic disability and instability, Kornilov hoped to secure the rights of his party and the People's Republicans' party as a bulwark against the left and even some of the more liberal right. But this promise and hope for Kornilov was soon lost when Black Monday hit the Berlin Stock Exchange. Although not directly hitting Russia immediately, Kornilov knew it would hit and soon worked to organize a secret police, the Orkhana, 
order to take down the revolutionary movement that would prop up the mammoth economy, went down and depressed. Another world, Afghanistan declared war on India. For what reason? Unknown. The Dominion of India hoped that this should be easy threat, and Afghanistan hoped that their sudden attack would come as a surprise and force Delhi to surrender, or at least accept their terms. Nonetheless, in the West, the travel leaders were elected in France, a syndicalist faction, but they kept their power from before, more monitored in between the radical socialists and the totalitarian totalists. In the meanwhile, Kornilov ordered the production of convoys to secure Russia's trade, although that was lackluster, especially that black one they had arrived, it was not expecting to get better. Russia continued teetering in the balance. Who will triumph in the end? was a question many asked. No one knew. Gunnilov hoped he could keep his alliance together, but Safkunov was not so polite. He himself hoped to push Gunnilov out of the sphere and achieve total control of Russia, put his order on things. Gunnilov, however, was too powerful to let that happen. For now, so Safkunov. In the meantime, Pius XI died in Italy. A new pope was needed to assert their dominance over the Southern Socialist Republic. And then Black Monday they hit Russia. Let's hope the government will save us from the worst, acclaimed the pop economic minister, who had no faith in the government, said sarcastically. And this did not help the stability of Russia, which felt even lower and then lower into a disaster area. Who knew it would happen? Putilov, the economic minister and the former bank president, had no solutions. He offered to bail out the economy and major banks in Russia, but there was no money for that. In Altinian Romania, the Romanians simply remilitarized a key area. No one paid attention. A Menshevik, a social democrat, Maria Spritanova, was assassinated by Sabakinov's combat squads. Although Kornilov did not like outright assassinating enemies, he approved, as the left was now in disarray and no longer posing a threat to the Kornilov Sabakinov diarchy. This was good news at least. With the Ukraina slowly being reintroduced into Russian society, it looked like stability might last. But this was not known at the time. And everyone waited and held their breath, hoping they weren't a target, and hoping they could stay alive. Because of this, and the introduction of the secret police, which was coming up, and the death of Maria, and the disarray of the leftists, stability actually came up. Of course, that's not it's easy to be said considering it was a massive disaster before. But it was something. And this ensured that at least a couple of civilian factories would be churning out goods with the state and not defeating the people. In the West, the first International Congress was created for the syndicalists. And out in the Far East, the Republic of China declared a civil war for southern China. The Germans had a supreme authority there though. It remained to be seen whether Wilhelm would tolerate this. Who knew? Lord Carnot and the secret police were reintroduced on the 7th of April. And now a plot against Russia was discovered for the newly introduced police. Mayor Spadovra's death prevented a possible riot to the leftists. But the situation in the country was still troublesome. And now, it turned out the new government has many loyalists on the other side of the Russian society. Old friends of Sabatikov, the famous philosopher Dmitry Meryoskovka, and his wife Zelaya Gipios, had published an appeal to the new leaders of the country. They claimed that Russia was to purify from internal enemies, or to spread the chaos and to betray their national interests. Their position actually gave us significant support among the citizens of Moscow and Petrograd. With this support, and seeing the political situation was stabilizing. Seems was key. 
In the West, Nicholas de Glass was elected as chairman of the Trade Union Council in Britain. And in Russia, agitation proceeded in the countryside. It seemed that political stability was still too far. Savkinov and Kordilov both agreed to eliminate the agitator. Supreme Privy Council. As the dictatorship was formed, the Privy Council still had its rights. Or so. Savikinov proposed the recreation of the Privy Council once again, which, once in the Russian history, had both executive and legislative power, and had consisted of the small number of the most important Russian ministers. Now, with this, Savikinov proved to have some semblance of democracy still left over. It would include three party members, with Savikinov at the top, along with Kornilov, and his three old comrades from the Russian army. The Council will issue executive orders that shall have superior over the Russian laws. History repeats itself, but at least it had some semblance of plurality and democracy, which only improves stability, although by little. And now they go on. The factory is barely churning out. The voz of the peasants and Kornilov decided to cancel the industrialization plan that Kerensky put forward, leaving only a single factory in Polska to be constructed. The reasoning was that the Soviets were too much of a threat to both factories and land, and opposite the building near Ukraine, and in the north, away from the Soviet power base, and more towards the whites. Not that it mattered, as there was no industry to speak of, even build the factories, but if the day came of Black Monday and Russia was stabilized, it happened. And now, initial stabilization. With the first wave of crisis slowly passing by, some less affected branches of the economy has bounced off the bottom. Of course, Black Monday was still bad. With the stabilization occurring, more factors were brought up for use, and it seemed the economy might come back. And the political area and the arena would stabilize. Now, the first women's division of death, the colonel of the Russian army, Maria Bokhova. He recently requested government to allow the formation of her division. Accepting the proposal will surely boost strength of our army and not to forget significant part of Agana value, but conservative elements in our armed forces are willing to change the status quo and will be taken into consideration as well. In semblance of security, Kornilov said no. And hoping the political stability and the conservative alliance would hold, hold strong by saying no to women's rights. The yeah, Congress is also a thing, although not much of a concern, it's a coin of love. Now, Felix Yosipov, in the Supreme Privy Council. The richest man of Russia, well-known aristocrat. He's always wanted to be political life in Russia, but even using his money, he could only get a small group of supporters in the Senate and the Duma. But with the Supreme Privy Council, Felix had finally understood how he can get on the highest post of the Russian Republic. He proposed to create the United Civil and Military Engineering Organization, with him on the top, which would use his money to start up capital. But in exchange of this necessary investment for our country, Felix asked us to make him the new Privy Council. Kornilov and Savkinov could find little reason to refuse. And so with the political stability and new capital and the economy, all was well. And finally in Rome, the Papal Conclave officially elected Pius XII. A typical papist and Catholic, he had a rigid authority in Italy. Research was done. Concentrated industry was on the next focus for Russia. And in other realms, new planes, the I-28, was also put into research. Although the army department opted for interwar artillery, but Kornilov, liking the authority of the Air Force, disagreed. And Poland, who could not seize her king, decided to seize control with the military. And now Winnesław Sikorski took full control of Poland, getting rid of the monarchy in any sense of the republic, and making himself king, as a matter of fact. And Maxim Gorky, 68, our final writer died. Famous, 
A writer. He came with some political loss, but overall had no effect. The first Fifth Congress of Great Italian in the Social Republic of Italy ended in victory in Italy. Who knows what will happen? In Spain, a successful revolution. Excuse me, not Spain. Siam. A successful revolution was achieved by a group of officers and intelligence. And they took power and put the king, Kana Waraston, on the throne, which was, of course, little concern to the Russians, who were still recovering the depths Black Monday and the death of Alexander Kerensky. Things were looking better, though. Even though Kornilov was a brutal dictator, Savikov was as well, the people did not revolt, and the Soviets were nowhere to be seen. Emphasis was put on a new doctrine. Mass war assault doctrine to take advantage of the Russian manpower that was not ultimately put together in the First World War. Of course, the military was in the back for all of this, as of course there was no need for the military. People thought, with the economy in ruins, the military can have cannot even acquire funding or rifles, which was true. But reforms were proposed. And these proposals were considered by Kornilov. If you look up here, you can see Marshal Denikin's plan on the left. Denikin opted for mass assault doctrine and mobilization of the Russian cavalry forces. While Wrangel, the then took over Petrograd, opted for more a grand battle plan, similar to the British system. Shatilov preferred superior firepower, creating Russian industry to create artillery and rain them with death. And there was Markovs, who preferred tanks and armor, but this was largely ignored as the power to great this was far within Russia's reach. In the end, in, to, in order to ensure stability, Enikin's plan was chosen, and mass assault doctrine was already popular among the generals at the time and among Kornilov himself. And now, the Orthodox Church. Kornilov was Heartfully orthodox and opted for a holy state. Savkinov was less of this, but listened to Kornilov. And so his state religion was proposed, a modern secular state was also proposed, and Kornilov, who wanted to have a major role in the government. But uh, Savkinov could not allow this and agreed that Orthodox Christianity should be, again, remade into a state religion. At least for political stability, which it brought many. The Soviets did not like it, but the Soviets were not the majority. And now it seemed the Russian Republic was recovering. In the East, the Republic of China took over the German counterparts. And then the leftist Kuomintang, Sun Ching Ling, wife of the late Sun Yat-sen, took control and back to Russia, things were getting better. Black Monday was still having an effect and Kerensky's death was banned, but the Soviet threat was not realized, at least fully, and the military was coming back. The Liberals, of course, did not like the fact that the Orthodox Church was coming back as a state religion. Kornilov opted to encourage a national debate on religious matters. In order to encourage pluralism, even though he had a dictatorship, but he wanted the semblance of pluralism and political stability, which was important for him. All things going well, Denikin's plan for his army was ready to be done, and in almost a month actually was the projected time. With this, Kornilov thought that Russia would be secure, and with Russia secure, all was well. No, the capital was a new question. Savakinov offered from Moscow as a new public. But Kornilov was traditional and wanted to stay in Petrograd. In the end, it seemed Kornilov had the power and Petrograd was declared. Savakinov was rather disappointed with this. But that was not important. As Kornilov held the national mass for the motherland, and in the West, American democracy was over, 
as MacArthur in general took control after realizing the threat of the syndicalists and the reactionaries. Back home, Savikinov wanted to be his own MacArthur, or something similar, but Kornilov was always in his way. One day, Savikinov promised he'd take over, but for now, Kornilov was firmly in power. Denikin's plan was also finally realized. And with that, a full army modernization was put into schedule. Russia at the time still was running short on rifles, and the factories were not humming very well. It was the Black Monday and the political instability. But besides that, Denikin's plans increased political power and stability. Unlike in Rangoon University, all the way down in Burma, even worse. And once again, the liberals criticized the Kalenshi, and quite a lot encouraged a national debate on the matter. Once again, ensuring political stability. It seemed the worst was over for Russia. Not economically, but politically, yes. And things were stable. Although many did love the rights provided by Kerensky's government, which were now taken away by Kornilov and Savikinov's alliance. But for the meantime, people not dying in the streets and the economy was seeing an improvement. Russia seemed like it would stay together. The worst was over, at least. <laughs>